Hello, and welcome to Heartstock Radio. I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Remember that you can email us at heartstockradio at gmail.com. We're always excited to receive your communications. Today, our guest is Deanna Cohen, and she is the founder of Plastic Pollution Coalition. In just a moment, she's going to be with us and tell us all about the work that she's doing. I was just listening before this call to her TED Talk also, so I'm sure you can find her there as well. We'll bring her on in just a moment, and I'm sure she can give us all proper directions. I'm Carol Murphy, your host. We'll be right back with Deanna, and Daniel Hogan is in the studio. This is Heartstock. Welcome once again. This is Heartstock Radio. I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Daniel Hogan is in the studio. Today, our guest is Deanna Cohen. She is the founder of Plastic Pollution Coalition. She's also an artist. And because I did listen to the TED Talk, there is connection here. Hi, Deanna. How are you? And thanks for being on Heartstock. Hi, Carol. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Indeedy. So what is the Plastic Pollution Coalition? Give our listeners a little introduction here. Sure. Sounds good. So the Plastic Pollution Coalition is a global alliance uh, at, we're a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. And I kind of know the answer to this, (laughs) but how did you come to start the Plastics Pollution Coalition? What was the impetus to all of this? Well, I think it was a culmination of a bunch of different things. In college, I went to UCLA here in Southern California, and I studied biology, and art. And my idea was to do preventative cancer research uh, because my mother passed away when I was in high school from breast cancer. So that was really my impetus when I started university. And I tried to do a major. That was a tough, tough thing to do at that time. But with an interest in both science and art, I was mainly painting originally, but then I started doing collage work and using cut up pieces of plastic bags, you know, found pieces, um, found bags, friends, other artists started saving plastic bags for me. I was cutting those up and sewing them back together. And I've now been working with that material for just going on 30 years, cutting it up, sewing it back together, making two and three dimensional pieces, originally showing it, showing it in galleries, then showing it in foundations and museums. And as I was working with plastic, to make these pieces and sculptural pieces, I started noticing things about the material. And that coincided with becoming a certified diver when I was 25, learning how to surf when I was 30, and and becoming an eternally aspiring longboarder. (laughs) And growing up here in Southern California, just really an, an interest in not only celebrating the environment and the ocean, but working with this material to make my artwork. And so it kind of all came together when some of the pieces I'd made after they were about eight years old started to fissure or break apart some of the bags and some of my pieces. I got excited about it and I thought it meant that the plastic was ephemeral like us, like a plant, like a flower, like our bodies. But what I came to realize is that it may have additives in it, it may have been exposed to sunlight or heat, and it's just breaking apart into smaller pieces. And that's when I started also noticing more and more plastic in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, in, in the Mediterranean, and becoming concerned about that. Originally trying to pick it up, carry it out, and put it in a waste, waste bin, a garbage bin, but then realizing, no, what is the impact of what's happening here? So it really kind of all began to swirl together. 
And then I started hearing, he almost felt like a lone voice at the time back in 2007, 2008, Captain Charles Moore, who founded Algalita Marine Research Institute. And I started hearing him talk about this thing called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch out in the Pacific Ocean. And I became interested in that. And of course, I think, you know, wanting to clean it up, wanting to clean up this mess that I was discovering while I was working with this material to make my artwork at the same time. So so again, kind of this culmination. And as I began to learn more about the material and what was happening in terms of it getting into the ocean and into our environment, I also began to learn that some of the chemicals used to make plastic are endocrine disrupting chemicals and that they impact and affect our body almost like synthetic estrogen. So having my mother having been ill and then passing away from breast cancer, which when I 13 to 17, I had learned her type of breast cancer was estrogen receptive. I started to make connections that the chemicals in plastic were beginning to be linked to human health problems. And that all, again, swirled together, meeting other people, doing research, trying to understand this issue, trying to get my head, my hands, my head around it. And I came together with a group of people, and together we created Plastic Pollution Coalition. So I guess that's the easiest way to say how I got from maybe point A to point B. Yes, and that's an amazing story. But I'm wondering, I have to go back because I'm always amazed with our program, the diverse backgrounds that individuals have, you know, nobody has this linear path. And I'm just curious, you kind of spoke about a little bit, why the dual major in in particular kind of combining biology and art? That's not something I hear very often. <laughs> Well, well, it's interesting that you ask that. I mean, now I meet I meet young people really for the last 10 years or so who are studying art at MIT or at Caltech. And I'm, you know, obviously I'm envious because to me, uh, it was quite interesting at UCLA, the, the science department was at the bottom of South Campus and the art department was at the top of North Campus. And this made it really difficult to take classes in both. I was basically always covered with sweat running back and forth, you know, from the two polar ends of the campus and begging people to let me in classes that were not part of my major. So it was difficult to do at the time for me, but I had always considered myself an artist and a person who was creative. And I think really in a way, I am a mixture of my parents. My mother was the executive director of the Los Angeles Free Clinic and was a social worker and did was the director of different organizations that were working for social justice issues and health issues around health. And my father is an author and a documentary filmmaker who had studied art as well as an undergrad. So I think I just kind of fell fell into being, I'm a mixture of the two of them. So I think that's where that came from. But also just feeling that science and the sciences benefit greatly from people who can think outside the box. Yes, and that creativity often, I notice, does run through the veins of many activists and entrepreneurs who um, do think outside the box. So I, I love that explanation. And what was it like? I mean, you talked a little bit about going to UCLA what time period was this and what kind of influences or activism was going on on campus at that time? Yeah, so I was there in the 80s. Let's see, what was going on around that time? Well, at some point, after after two years in the biology department, I transferred to the art department. And literally the months that I arrived in the art department, there was a big move by the current chancellor of the time. Uh, to remove or to dismantle, I guess, to dismantle the undergraduate uh, arts programs. Ooh, that's, and that's that dramatic. really brought me the wrong, the wrong <laughs> yeah. way. Uh, so I went to an initial meeting in the theater, de- theater department with a bunch of people from different arts departments, film, television, art, and design. 
and the music department. So I went to a meeting and a gathering and some people that I was talking to in the audience encouraged me to come up on stage with them. And I ended up leading a letter writing campaign that we did to the university to stop them from dismantling the undergraduate arts department. Mm. And you were successful, it sounds like? We we were successful. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> now, And you mentioned you, that you had a powerful influence from both of your parents. And I'm wondering um, if you had any other influences that kind of you can look back on now that led you down to the path that you're on now with the Plastics Pollution Coalition? Uh, I mean, there, my influences are many. I, I was very much inspired and influenced by Captain Trolley Moore. I was very much inspired and influenced by Dr. Sylvia Earle, who is a, a marine biologist and referred to as her deepness. She founded Mission Blue. And around the time, right? Be, I met her, I think, just before she won the Ted Wish Prize back in 2008, which was to protect the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. Mm. Um, so they are both uh, have inspired me quite a bit. And I was also inspired by my partner of many years. It's Jackson Brown. He's a musician and an activist and has a very, very high work ethic, I would say, strong worth work ethic. And I think it's one of the things that, you know, brought us together, even as friends, is that we both had a very strong sense of social justice. I'm also very much inspired by my sister, who is the managing director of Plastic Pollution Coalition. Her name is Julia Cohen, and she's based in Washington, D.C., and she has a master's in public health. So yeah. we're going to take our midway point break here, and we've got a lot more of Deanna's story to tell. We'll be right back. This is Heartstock. Thanks for listening. This is Heartstock Radio. I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Today, we're speaking with Deanna Cohen, and she's telling us all about Plastics Pollution Coalition. Can we kind of start, I guess, kind of focusing on the history of your organization? You talked about, you know, the founding uh, a little earlier. Can you kind of maybe take us through the historical path of, you know, when you were founded and how you kind of got to where you are and where you are now today? Sure. So we co-founded Plastic Pollution Coalition in 2009. We had... You and your sister? My sister was part of it. It was a larger group of people. Oh, okay. It included Julia, but it included other co-founders and founding members. So we were a whole collective group. Gotcha. So we created the organization together, and our initial goal was to shift the conversation about plastic and to shift the conversation away from calling it marine debris, litter, rubbish, waste, and garbage, and recognizing it when it gets into the environment and the ocean as pollution or into our bodies as pollution. So to call it what it is, to call it plastic pollution. And Plastic Pollution Coalition does this by educating, connecting, and advocating for a world free of plastic pollution. And as we've slowly grown, we initially were 10 groups our first year. The next year, we were 25 groups, I think two of which were businesses. And now, in 2022, we are just over 1,300 organizations and businesses from 75 different countries, and we're about 50% organizations and 50% businesses, and we have 130 or so just over that 
notable coalition members and supporters. We have a very active group of Plastic Pollution Coalition Youth Ambassadors, and we have a Plastic Pollution Coalition Scientific Advisory Board. What we've been able to do together collectively is uplift and share solutions to plastic pollution, and those include natural materials and non-toxic refillable and reusable systems and solutions, many of which include glass, steel, natural fibers, leaves, wood, bamboo, mushrooms, mushroom mycelium, algae, seaweed, and other materials as well. We use our collective voices, actions, and policies to make a difference. And how does one become a member of the coalition? You can visit the website if you'd like to learn more about our work, and you can apply to join our coalition as an individual or as an organization or a business, and we have a review pro- uh, process for that. Now, I'm just totally and completely both baffled and fascinated by alternatives to plastics. And, you know, I have to scratch my head every time I go to the store. It's like, why is this in plastic? Do you have an answer for me? Why Why do why, why is this, does it seem so challenging to get rid of this stuff? Well, I think the question to ask really, Carol, is how did we become a world that was so full of plastic and single-use plastic? And when did all of our food and beverages and beauty products and health products and cleaning products begin to be packaged in it? So (laughs) some of that is a result of, you know, the aftermath of World War II and factories being rebooted to produce plastic combs, plastic eyeglasses, um, and various things so that they would still continue to be useful. But I think maybe the most important part, and I should back up, because I think a lot of people are not aware that 99%, which is virtually all modern plastic, is made from fossil fuels, gas, oil, and increasingly it's made from coal. Yes, and there was a whole NPR program, I, I really, really sad that I cannot recall the journalist's name, where they investigated and basically discovered that the petroleum industry realized that this whole fallacy of recycling was never going to work, but it was a, a bill of goods that we were essentially sold to sell us on the idea of plastics. And yeah. Now that we're we are where we are and we're more aware and we know that there are these health risks, now what? Now what's the answer? I mean, have you in your mind's eye, if you had a magic wand, what would happen? What would we do? Uh if I had a magic wand? Yes. I would <laughs> immediately put us in a world that was free of plastic pollution. And what would a plastic a particularly single-use plastic, what would a single-use plastic-free world look like? And then I'd work backwards mm-hmm. from that to get, us, to get us where we need to be. But I mean, if I had yeah. a magic wand, I'd take us back in a, in a sense, but mm-hmm. with a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the benefits that we've gotten just from the contemporary world, they don't all have to be made out of single-use plastic. Mm-hmm. And what's the and, I mean, my preference too, I just have to say, yes. is to drink beverages out of real glass mm-hmm. or out of food grade stainless steel or mm-hmm. copper or ceramic and a ceramic mug. Yeah. <laughs> There's great joy and beauty in that or porcelain or whatever you've got, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I I think there's a real beauty in that. And I was actually reminiscing about it this afternoon with a friend that is such a shame that Oftentimes we hold on to our most precious, you know, set of dishes or something like that that have been handed down and we only use them once a year or twice a year for a holiday rather than using them all the time, which I think frankly would probably benefit our health. So is there a viable, I keep hearing about these alternatives, you know, every single thing I buy at the the drugstore comes in a plastic bottle. What 
what is the alternative to that? Is there a biodegradable plastic, I guess is what my real question is, um, that doesn't linger in the environment and doesn't pose a health risk? There are a lot of upcoming materials that are not plastic that could replace plastic. It's a question of what are the different aspects or elements of that that we want to make sure that we have. And and unfortunately, what plastic's been used for, it's been used to, I mean, a big, I, I think a big selling point that I see repeated all the time is that it's used to prolong shelf life for foods, you know, but how long do we want to extend food life on shelves? <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's one of the things it's used for, but glass is also wonderful for that. Um, I look at every day as a, a pretty fun challenge and I make a point to buy my fruit and vegetables from local farmers that I've gotten to know at the various farmers markets around the city in Los Angeles or when I'm traveling to find out where the farmers markets are. Uh, so that I can actually have some interaction with people who are growing the food that I'm eating and my family's eating. And oftentimes, with a little bit of forethought, I can also bring some of my own containers or develop relationships with people who are making things I'd like to get. And if they don't come in glass, I can ask them if they would be willing to bring it in glass the next week for me. Mm. I make a point of also doing my marketing and looking for products at refill and reuse shops where I can refill containers that I've brought or get containers that are made out of bio-benign, non-toxic materials, again, like glass or stainless steel. And I, I tend to have my loyalty go to that and to the companies that are providing those kinds of things, uh, bamboo toothbrushes. Um, toothpaste that comes in a little glass container and is a tablet that you just mix with your own water when you go to brush your teeth, et cetera. So, but there's some really good stuff happening, interesting things happening with seaweed and mushroom and mushroom mycelium and making packaging and containers that can be used in existing plastic extruding machines and also can be used in place of polystyrene or styrofoam, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's good stuff happening. Yes, it is exciting in the materials world, world for sure. And I'm just wondering also about some of your partners. Can you kind of talk about maybe current projects that you have going on or projects in the past that really were successful and who some mm -hmm. of those partners might be? Sure. Uh, so we have produced two guides in collaboration with Made Safe. Made Safe Certified is a, a coalition member group that is hired by companies and researches and certifies their products to be non toxic and bio benign and makes recommendations about ingredients, et cetera, and products. We worked with Made Safe to produce a healthy baby guide. And then a couple of years later, a healthy pregnancy guide. And what those really are, are there, it's a plastic free baby guide and a plastic free pregnancy guide. And actually the plastic free pregnancy guide, both of them, what they really are is plastic free living guides. So they have useful information in them for everyone, even people who are not looking at starting a family. Um, and they're just available through our website for free as materials, as resources. And that would be at plasticpollutioncoalition.org if someone's interested in finding the guides. And what lays ahead? What do you have planned for the future? Ooh, we've got really great things planned for the future. Uh, one of them is a project that we just launched in the fall last year, and it's called Flip the Script on Plastics. And the focus is to flip the script on plastics in entertainment and popular culture. We have actually a webinar that's coming up next week, September 14th, that will be bringing our global community together to share latest information, tips, and resources to stop the growing plastic pollution crisis. And our webinars are free to the public. Um, 
the September 14th webinar is called Crafting Hollywood Storylines That Flip the Script on Plastic, and it's going to be moderated by Kate Fold. She's the director of Hollywood Health and Society, which is part of the Norman Lear Center at the University of Southern California at USC, and with Emily Gallagher and Austin Elston. They are the founders of Fishtown Films. It's a zero-waste film production company. And the producer and writer, Scott Z. Burns. And our webinar that we is just passed, that we just had, but it's available to watch online on our website, was titled, Will Mushrooms and Seaweed Help Replace Single-Use Plastics? And it featured three of our coalition member businesses, the company Sway, and they work with algae and seaweed, Ecovative, who work with mushrooms and mushroom mycelium, and Lollyware, who work with uh, seaweed and algae as well. And that we take all of our webinars and we archive them on our site so that you can always go and reference them and watch webinars past. Hmm. We have just a couple minutes left. And in your TED Talk, you mentioned the idea of going out and cleaning this up. What's wrong with that idea? <laughs> all, well, this, I mean, all this waste just floating in the ocean and it's all collecting in the gyre. Yeah, and we have coalition members who are focused on cleaning it up. But mm-hmm. cleaning it up doesn't stop the massive uptick in production as the fossil fuel industry and the petrochemical industry shift to manufacturing more and more plastic as their plan B because people are divesting from fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. So cleaning something up doesn't prevent it. Yeah, it just keeps growing and growing. I mean, how how much you ever take away, there's always a, a new supply, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I mean, the best example of it is if you've got a bathtub and it's overflowing with water, let's say it's overflowing with plastic, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, are you going to take a teaspoon and start bailing stuff, the water out? Or will you turn off the tap first? So we really focus on creating tools and guides and sharing resources and information that help people target all the upstream points Mm -hmm. to measurably reduce single-use plastic. And that includes, you know, they're included in our resource library, our guides, the Understanding Packaging Scorecard, our collaboration with Yelp, And, you know, now with Flip the Script on Plastics. And how might folks find you if they want to learn more or participate? Sure. We're easy to find. Uh, Our website is www.plasticpollutioncoalition.org, O-R-G. But you can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. And we are at Plastic Pollutes with an F. Thank you so much, Deanna, for your work, especially for sharing your story also on Heartstock. I really, really appreciate it. It's awesome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Indeedy. And as always, we shall see you next week. Until then, peace. I saw a sign there, and on the sign Heartstock Radio is a production of KBMF 102.5 Butte America Radio. Hear our programs every Friday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time via live stream at butteamericaradio.org.